Hello, welcome to Backstory with Joan Goldstein. I'm Joan Goldstein. My guest today is an amazingly intelligent and interesting young man. His name is Robbie Ball. And he is, he's actually from California, but at the moment he is a graduate student in New York City. He is with the City University of New York, CUNY. And his work in uh, soci psychology is very, very unusual and very, very interesting. And he's going to tell us about it because <clears throat> he's not studying people, but he's studying animals. And tell us about it, Robbie. What is it that who what what are you looking at, and what is it you're trying to understand? Thank you very much for that very nice introduction, Joan. Uh, yeah, so I'm a PhD student at the CUNY Graduate Center, and I study cognitive and comparative psychology, specifically in elephants. Uh, in in a, a lab to which I'm a graduate student, comparative cognition for conservation, where we study multiple animals, but focus on elephants, specifically Asian elephants in Thailand. And we're curious about how their cognition is fundamentally different than a more typical human approach because they're very evolutionarily distant from us, as we can see from them looking fairly different than us. Um, but yet we still consider them very intelligent uh, animals. And so, we're curious how their their cognition, how the functions in their mind that translate into their interaction with the world um, operate on a very different level than us. And applying that, we're, we're interested in how that information actually applies to uh, issues of endangerment and conservation with Asian elephants, very much so in danger. We want to identify means of their sensory perception and interaction with their environment and how we can use that information to design better solutions that result in uh, in few, fewer deaths of elephants, frankly. Yeah, anthropogenically involved uh, deaths, that would be. Yes, and this is observational. Uh, you're not giving them surveys to fill out, are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, if they want to fill out a survey, no. Um, so the research uh, I do is uh, part of my, my advisor, my advisor, Dr. Josh Plotnick, who uh, kind of started a lot of cognitive research um, uh, with elephants and uh, a good amount of it uh, was actually experimental. We talk about experimental psychology studies with elephants that might seem a bit, a, a, a bit confusing, a bit daunting because you know, how, do you, how do you test an animal that large? Um, but there are some amazing ways to, to end up doing that and, and a lot of his work um, looked at various uh, sensory and social aspects. Uh, so now we're a little bit more interested in uh, observing wild elephants and seeing how they might interact with their environment. But originally we, we uh, test, or I didn't test, my advisor tested captive elephants, and that was more easy to, to, to do an experimental task with. But with, with wild elephants, you would imagine there'd have to be a, a little more observational involved. Mm hmm. And aren't you yourself going to do some of that observation pretty soon? Yes, that's, that's correct. So um, I, I just finished my second year of my PhD and uh, I, I should have I should have uh, at this point um, ideally been to Thailand where we study the elephants. But of course, there's been a pandemic which has made international travel very difficult, if not impossible. And so now that things are getting easier, uh, we're going this summer, my lab with some other grad students and my advisor, and we're going there and starting to get, get our feet wet with some research. Mm -hmm. So what would that involve? I mean, you know, how do you observe wild elephants? So that's a, that's a good question. And to be honest, I'm not sure if I'm the best to answer that because I still haven't been there, actually. A lot of what I've done here in New York has been uh, looking at and at, and trying to identify various behaviors uh, of elephants, kind of social affiliations or, or, or individual behavior uh, in, in these wild elephants. And what you do to obtain that data, uh, typically you either have towers and sanctuaries where you can record video or you might have, uh, you might have like 
camera traps, what we call tied to trees, and you can get data that way. But um, I can't speak too much, honestly, about what it's like to be there when I haven't been there, unfortunately. You know, <clears throat> today when I took my walk outside along this wonderful path, there was a, a, a person, a woman who I occasionally bump into who walks her dog. And we walked together for a while, and I was telling her about us being able to meet and tape on the show today. And she says that she has read or heard that elephants are very, very interesting societies, mm -hmm. that they give first preference to the oldest elephant when they're giving out food, or is it the youngest elephant? Well, I, I, I that makes a lot of sense to prioritize the, the, the prayer is the old. Uh, the, the matriarch is a very important part of elephant social society, uh, or however, however you want to describe it. Uh, so uh, typically in an elephant social group, uh, the, the, the young males, the bulls, they grow up and they typically go outside of the group. But the herd, whatever, uh, uh, the herd is typically composed of females all the way up to the matriarch and, and, young, and young bulls. And so the, the matriarch does have what we understand power among the group you could say and and what's interesting specifically about the elephant uh social groups is that they have what we call a fission fusion society so what that means is you have members who are going in and out of the group and, th and that's something we have too that's something that chimpanzees have too where you have friends who you're closer with or you're, you're less close with. So you kind of go in and out and you man your group. And that's that's very different than an animal that might have a static herd. You might have uh, you know, a group of deer that all stay together in one group and they move as a group. Elephants are different in that they go in between different groups. Mm -hmm. And there's a certain ranking in terms of who gets the food or who gets uh, other types of attention. Is that true? <clears throat> I haven't done too much research in that regard, actually. But I, I am familiar with that. I, I believe so, yes. Mm -hmm. So there's how does the message come across? Oh, what was the other thing she told me that they have been observed to grieve when one of them dies? Have you heard about that? Yes, yeah, I'm familiar with that. So that's actually common among uh, uh, several different species of, of animals, but definitely been observed with elephants. Um, they have mourning periods. And, and and observe the deaths of uh, of members of their group. Yes. So, in other words, we're not the only ones out there. We're not the only ones uh, mourning, grieving, or being joyous, I guess, or being hungry <laughs> and getting fed. You know, who mm -hmm. feeds us? Who exactly. Feeds us? Yeah. So, would the elephant, if I was hungry and I was out in the woods, would the elephants give me any food because I'm a female? <laughs> That's that's an interesting question. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it. I wouldn't recommend <laughs> any human go out and try to live with the elephants or really any wild animal. That's actually something that we're really uh, passionate about communicating is, uh, you know, wild animals are wild. They're not meant to, they're not, they're not likely going to be friendly with, with humans. And uh, often some severe accidents can happen with humans who think otherwise. Uh, and I would not recommend, especially with an elephant, getting too close because they'll perceive you as a stranger and uh, that, you know, they might pick up that you're a female, but that's not necessarily going to, you know, make them friendly to you because if you're a stranger and they don't know if you're safe or not and you're getting up in their proximity and touching them, they might think, hey, who is this? I'm not comfortable with this. And, and bad things could happen because they're much stronger than us. Mm -hmm. And something else that she told me was uh, that there was a someone who gave a piece of candy, I think, to an elephant. Mm -hmm. And a year later, they're out there somewhere, and uh, the elephant is there, and it comes up to her looking for another piece of candy. In <laughs> other words, <laughs> if this is the elephant never forgets. Is that the story that the elephant knew? This was the person who gave him a candy a year earlier. Is that so? <laughs> so the the whole elephants never forget um, kind of cultural notion is is a super interesting one because there's 
many anecdotal stories about elephants having this amazing memory of remembering another elephant or another human from years ago and suddenly they you know they remember that association like you described the candy so in terms of the research there hasn't been a, 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 a huge amount of research on exactly how their memory works but what i find very interesting is that because we mentioned candy so that's going to be a pretty potent smell for an elephant and elephants have these absolutely massive um olfactory uh bulbs and they can they can perceive many different smells with you know very fine detail kind of telling the difference between like the perfect piece of corn in a field or or a not so right piece of corn um and then on top of that they can smell from long distances too so it's very possible that in that sort of uh, candy anecdote that um, that maybe the elephant would have remembered, hey, you're the one that smelled like that really nice smell I remember from so back long. <laughs> so we better make sure we put our uh, nice perfume on when we <laughs> talk to the elephants. <laughs> if you want to leave a good impression, yeah. <laughs> right, leave a good impression so they'll remember us next year. What was something else someone told me uh, about? I mean, the people apparently have been following stories about elephants. Mm -hmm. um, well, it, it'll come back, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so when you go to, you're going to um, Tanzania? Thailand. Thailand, sorry, you're going to Thailand mm -hmm. and you're going to be there for five weeks? About, yeah. About yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be going from uh, July through uh, August, yeah. Okay, so what is your go assignment or goal? What is it that you're going to be doing yourself? Um, so I have I have plans right now that, that we're working on um, some specific research. Uh, and to be honest, I shouldn't speak too much about it because it's still in planning that, you know, this isn't published work. So I don't want to, I don't want to speak too broadly before, you know, I know exactly what happens, but I can tell you what I'm very interested in. And what I'm very interested in is, uh, communication between elephants and between environments, environmental threats, such as, uh, predators or, or human activities, which could kind of be like a predator. So we know from, ex from experimental and observational studies in the past that, uh, that anthropogenics, you know, human settlement and development um, can cause noise and disturbances to to elephant populations. And so we also know that um, that that elephants respond to certain audio cues or olfactory cues. Uh, they are, can be startled when you uh, have a, a various, you know, a vocalized predator call or something like that. And, and to clarify, um, Elephants don't typically actually have predators, but there have been observed instances of lions um, predating on elephant calves or, or tigers predating on elephant calves in India. Um, so what I'm very interested in is looking at how uh, how an elephant in a wild environment might respond to various um, various sounds, calls that are potential threats, and see uh, see how that might affect their willingness to enter a human settlement. I also heard from someone that they're getting into trouble because they're uh, invading areas that humans are. Mm -hmm. Do you know what that's about? So that's likely what we call crop raiding, which is uh, part of this whole conservation anthropogenic issue. So what, what has happened is our, 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 our species, the human race, uh, is building at a rapid pace to 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 create the anthropocene that's even larger than it than it was 10 years ago 100 years ago by by, by massive scope and what's happening in, in especially developing nations in 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 asia in in africa is that uh we're building uh developments really close to wild animal habitats and as a result that creates two problems the first problem is that the elephants and other animals too have reduced habitat size, which means they have less access to various resources such as food and water. And the other part is that many of these uh, developments are are include farmland, and and this isn't even necessarily huge agricultural farmland; it could be subsistence farming from you know from locals and towns. And uh, the issue is that, an, as I said before, an, an elephant can have an extreme um, sense of smell. So you might have a farmer who's farming sugarcane and they're trying, you know, to make make their living. They're trying they're they're creating a product that's going to be sold. 
and the elephants say, hey, I can smell that sugar cane from a mile away. Can I have some? Or more like, I'm going to take some. So what's been observed is, uh, is some of these elephants will just simply break into these farms and crop raid and they'll take it. And, and that's really uh, difficult for both parties involved, actually, because it means a reduced crop yield that the, that the farmer can sell. And it means that the elephant is getting not a very good nutritional diet if it's just eating sugar cane. But also, aren't they being attacked for, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so there's an, there's a, a, to a topic we refer to as human elephant conflict, uh, which is a, a specific part of what we would call human wildlife conflict. And in human elephant conflict, it may seem as if that means a conflict between the elephants and the humans, who's going to win. But we kind of know that because we're humans and we're very good at killing. So the conflict is not between us and elephants. It's between humans on our ability to mitigate a con conflict. And so it's very easy, unfortunately, to, to shoot an elephant. It's very easy to kill one if you need to. And when it comes to, you know, me or the elephant, a lot of people would say, I'm not going to lose my life over an elephant, you know, not to say that many cultures uh, that uh, live in regions where there are elephants as local uh, wildlife, many of these uh, people in their cultures, they, they revere elephants significantly. So generally, we don't, nobody really wants to kill an elephant, but in a situation where it might just be me or you, um, a lot of elephants end up dying. And so that's where our research kind of comes into play and says, hey, maybe there's a way we can mitigate this by creating some sort of deterrence or some sort of alternative strategy for the elephants so they don't have to crop rate. Hmm. There we go. Saving the elephants. Ideally, we'd like that. Yes, yes. You said that with a smile. Yeah. Well, you know, Robbie, we know each other for the first time. We met each other for the first time quite recently. And what, what, what was that about? You want to share? <laughs> okay. Interesting way to, to pull this in. Yeah. So I'm, I'm very glad to be here. This is especially special because, uh, John Goldstein, you are my, uh, you're my great aunt. And uh, I grew up in California, in Los Angeles, and spent most of my life uh, in Southern California. Um, and I recently moved out to New York uh, to start my PhD here. And you are in Princeton, so I had uh, heard from my mother, my my wonderful mother, who had who had uh, seen you somewhat recently, and she said you you need to meet your great aunt, uh, and because I had never met you before, and so, and here we are right now. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> what a joy it was! I have never seen you before. I maybe knew about you, but I didn't. And of course, your mother and I speak very often on the phone, mm -hmm. at least once a week or so, we, we keep in touch with each other. She was on one of my TV shows. I remember, yeah. Yes, yes, this is quite a while ago. And so uh, when uh, she told me that you wanted to meet me, you and your sister, Fiona, mm -hmm. wanted to meet me, I was thrilled. So we made a, a date to meet, they, came, they both came out to Princeton and they, they knew where I was living and we spent a few hours together. And it was magical. It was absolutely magical. And I was so happy I had a chance to get to know you. And of course, isn't it interesting? You're studying psychology. Mm -hmm. Your grandfather, my brother, Michael, mm -hmm. was a well-known psychologist in, in UCLA in California. He yeah. wrote a number of books, including Experiences in Anxiety. He wrote many books in, in, in psychology. And uh, I'm a sociologist, mm -hmm. and I have done studies on the Pine Barrens of New Jersey, of uh, people yeah. living in rural areas and changes going on in their world. So it seems like we all do have to follow, we're all following some sort of a path of trying to understand our world. I think you hit the nail on the head, Joan. Yeah. It's I'm amazing. Very passionate about it, too. This is. Yes. Yeah. From one generation to the next, even though you never got to know your grandfather, my brother, mm -hmm. because he had passed before you, uh, before you were born or right when you were born. Shortly after I was born, I believe. Yeah, shortly after you were born. So you never got to know Michael. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they came to visit, he and Fiona, I could show them a picture of my brother and I as children 
something that they knew nothing about. So there was the family tree, you see. And this was something that was quite uh, amazing for, for, for all of us. And I'm so glad that you came on my show today. Is there anything else you'd like to share? Um, well, first of all, thank you. That, that was, I mean, that was wonderful. I appreciate all of this. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, the only thing I think else I'd really like to share is that to, uh, to the viewers and to you, to anyone who sees this, um, you know, understand that this research with animals, uh, people who do this kind of research are extremely passionate. And when we talk about testing animals, experiments with animals, at least in, at least what I do, what I can speak of, what I know of, uh, these are not invasive. These are not traumatizing. These are not harmful experiments. Many people who study animals are very passionate about their conservation, about learning about them, about appreciating them. So it's important that we be responsible about our passion, about our interest. I think many of us, we all love animals, you know, whether it's our dog or if it's an elephant at the zoo or if it's a, that it's a sanctuary animal we see when we're traveling. It's really important that we maintain a, a, a strong responsibility to understand animals' roles in the environment, to understand that they have feelings and emotions and psychology that we can compare to our own in some ways. So we need to remember that animals are, are important and they're, they're not people, but they're, 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 they're important living organisms that we need to respect their, their ways of life. Wonderful, wonderful, yes. Maybe that'll help us to be more respectful of other humans. I think we could all stand to be a bit more friendlier these days, yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. One other thing we have in common, Robbie, what did you discover about me that was connected to what you were doing? Yeah, um, we, well, you have a PhD from the CUNY Graduate Center, and I'm currently working on my PhD from the CUNY Graduate Center, and I was delighted to hear that because I had no idea. I was going out to New York where I have a family history from, but didn't have a lot of personal experience. I wasn't familiar with the school systems here, but I was really deeply interested in CUNY and their access and research, sorry, reach to uh, underprivileged uh, students and, and uh, underrepresented students who um, CUNY welcomes and wants to support. And so I'm very, very glad to share this uh, title I'm working on that I will hopefully ideally get in a couple of years uh, that we will share. Yes, this is wonderful. Well, you know, Robbie Ball, it's been a joy to be with you today, as it was a joy when you came to visit me in Princeton. And I hope we'll stay connected and I hope you'll stay in touch when you go out to look at the elephants. And when you come back, you could maybe come on the show again and tell us what Gee, you yeah. what you discovered, what you experienced, all mm -hmm. of the adventures that are going to happen to you in the next couple of months. So Robbie Ball, thank you so much for coming to Backstory with Joan Goldstein. It's been a delight. Thank you, Joan. Yes. Goodbye. Goodbye. Okay.